Hi, I'm Richard Sever, editor of Cold Spring Harbor Perspectives. With me, I have Diane Mathis of Harvard Medical School. Diane, welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. Thank you. So great meeting. Yeah, it is. It is a great meeting. Um, what the, the the meeting we're at right now, of course, is the uh, the symposium on immunity and tolerance. And um, you have just put together this amazing book on immune tolerance. So it sort of struck me that you'd be perfectly positioned to explain immune tolerance to to me. So. Um, it putting, it's putting it sort of in, in a, a, a general way, what's the, what's the challenge that's faced by the body here? Uh, yeah, so um, immunological tolerance is a phenomenon that's fascinated immunologists for decades, and we still don't completely understand it. Uh, but the challenge is that um, the immune system was set up to uh, fight uh, a whole diversity of different kinds of microbial challenges bacteria, viruses, parasites. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, its uh, repertoire of T cells and B cells, uh, which are the major players in the adaptive immune system for clearing and dealing with infections, they must be very diverse. Um, and this, uh, each one of them has a different T cell receptor or B cell receptor. And uh, these receptors, the genes encoding these receptors, uh, are uh, assembled uh, by random processes. And just by chance, sometimes uh, the specificity um, that's generated by putting the different segments together uh, is able to see a component of the body uh, itself. So like a liver protein or a um, tongue protein or what, whatever. And uh, so there must be ways uh, to deal with this issue to either um, eliminate them from the repertoire or uh, silence them so they can't attack uh, the body's own cells. Right, and so th there are several different tolerance mechanisms, central and uh, peripheral tolerance mechanisms. Um, can you explain what's going on in central tolerance, which is in the thymus, right? Yes, so central tolerance um, is in the thymus uh, for T cells and in the uh, bone marrow for uh, B cells. Um, and uh, this deals with uh, a particular set of proteins, so ubiquitous proteins or proteins uh, that are just circulating uh, through the thymus. Um, and so um, there's a particular set of mechanisms that are used in these cases, and that's usually um, deletion uh, of the cell of the potentially autoreactive reactive cell from the repertoire, okay. basic, basically just killing it off. So if by accident you happen to have made a T cell that will start you know, doing you damage rather right. than pathogen damage, you have right. to delete right. it, right? Right. Uh, that being said, um, these mechanisms should not be completely effective because if you do that, you uh, don't generate enough diversity in the repertoire to be able to fight off all the different infections in the periphery. So there are additional layer of uh, mechanisms that take place in the periphery um, for um, uh, these kinds of specificities, but also specificities that are actually not even en encountered until uh, the T cells come out into the periphery. Right, so there, are, there will be self proteins that, right. that you would never come across in the thymus it that need to be. You think you might not uh, come across. Uh -huh. Uh, we've thought for many, many years that you didn't come across them, but maybe we'll talk a little bit about air, uh, uh -huh. and that's you do actually come, come across them. So, so, so air is a transcription factor expressed in the thymus, right. and that's involved in um, a deletion of these T-cell clones? Y yeah, so um, air's a fascinating protein that uh, was discovered from, uh, actually it's, a, it's an example of reverse translation where the original observations were in humans, a rare uh, multi-organ autoimmune disease, and the gene underlying this disease was found to be AIR. Uh -huh. And it turns out what AIR does uh, is in a really small fraction of stromal cells in the thymus, not the thymocytes, T cells themselves, uh, but in these stromal cells, um, AIR uh, turns on a huge repertoire of uh, messenger RNA transcripts encoding proteins that you wouldn't normally encounter uh, until the cells come out into, into uh -huh. the periphery. So what is it? What is it? It's the least tra least specific transcription factor well ever encountered. Yeah, well I'll <laughs> tell you that in, in a minute. But you know things like uh, insulin. Uh, there are transcripts of insulin in the thymus, mm -hmm. and actually, if you have good antibodies, you can even see insulin protein uh, in oh the wow. thymus. And there are liver proteins, 
25 or 30 different tissues uh, so far, um, transcripts uh, encoding proteins specific to those tissues have been found uh, in these really uh, rare cells uh, in the thymus. So a, as you said, th it's um, always, since we discovered this, it's been a question of how air can do this because um, there's so many genes, there are a few thousand genes, that even more maybe that air controls. And they're genes that, um, whose program uh, when they're expressed in the periphery are completely different. So like different amounts, different places, different timing. So the question is how could air control those? And uh, I guess it was last year or the year before we came across the answer. Uh, thanks to uh, advances in molecular biology largely and broader uh, genome studies, what it turns out is that um, uh, other people found that a major mechanism of controlling um, gene transcription is not just the binding uh, of the transcription factor or other factors to the promoter, but in many cases uh, they all bind quite fine. The polymerase starts and then it stops, and that's called polymerase pausing. Right. So it turns out that air um, binds to this complex of proteins that is involved in polymerase pausing and lifts uh, polymerase pausing. And in that sense, it works rather like MYC. Uh, MYC seems to have a similar mechanism. Um, we just heard some talks today saying that the same mechanism is used um, for uh, getting uh, naive T cells ready to make a rapid response. Uh, so there, are, in that case, all the promoters are all set up and then when you activate them, but they're paused, and then when you activate them, the pausing is lifted. And that's basically how we think that air works. Oh, I see. And, and so in these cells, you're, you're actually getting proteins produced, which are presumably immediately degraded so that they can be presented to the T cells yeah. to cause that's right. clonal deletion. Just like deletion. any antigen-presenting cell. Uh-huh. And is, uh, is the um, uh, protein degradation upregulated in these cells for this reason so that you don't have insulin and many other <laughs> polypeptides floating around doing stuff they shouldn't be. Yeah, um, we don't have evidence of protein degradation changing, but the w we think the mechanism that for dealing with the problem uh, that you evoke is that once you turn on air, the cells die rather rapidly. Uh -huh. um, so it's a great mechanism for showing a lot of different proteins. So as well as clonal deletion going on in the thymus, it is there something else going on there? I mean, with the, the what's the production of the regulatory T cells? These are not being deleted, they're being directed into an alternate fate, is that correct? Right, <coughs> so some people think of um, uh, the deletion and the generation of the regulatory T cells as being two sides of the same coin, one mm -hmm. which is immediately affected in the thymus and then the other one which is delayed but still generated in the thymus. So you generate these T regs which then come out and patrol uh, in the periphery. And um, so when uh, we first uh, found how we thought that um, air was operating and that it could be uh, controlling all these transcripts which are uh, then leading to clonal deletion uh, of the thymocytes, um, several, group, several people were skeptical because they felt that there just aren't enough of these rare medullary epithelial cells that are expressing these transcripts to be able to delete these um, <coughs> or s sample these many, many different uh, T cells. Uh, and so the idea was that, well, maybe they're affecting regulatory T cells, the selection of regulatory T cells. And we thought that was an interesting idea, but we couldn't find any data to support that because when we looked in sort of juvenile, you know, teenager or adult uh, mice, we didn't see uh, any differences in either the function or the numbers of regulatory T cells. <coughs> and, um, but that's what my talk is about today. Right. Because uh. we uh, discovered something new recently. Uh, you know, air, we think air seems to be very important, but uh, we made a mouse where we could uh, basically turn air and turn off turn air on and off whenever we wanted to. Uh -huh. It's a tetracycline regulatable right. system. And when we did that, we found that air is only necessary <coughs> for the, um, maybe the first week or so uh, of life. Of life. Okay. 
And that was a t completely unexpected finding and one that we just d didn't really understand. And so we've been working on that for the last two or three years. And what we f found that is that air is actually controlling uh, the generation of regulatory T cells, but just very early on during this narrow time window. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we can completely phenocopy uh, the air knockout mutation by um, depleting Tregs from zero, de zero days to 10 days. Okay, if we so it's a tiny window yeah, in which it's working. If we deplete Tregs, say, from 30 to 40 days, then we don't, and then there's nothing the you don't see this effect. Um, and so we've been studying, we have a, a reporter mouse and have been studying these Tregs that are generated in this early time window, and it's a, a, a completely different uh, type of uh, Treg with different um, properties and uh, than the o older ones that are generated in the adult. And they're actually stable. They generate neonatally, but uh, they're very, very stable uh, through months, months and months of life. Uh -huh. And so in the end, uh, air is controlling uh, the negative selection in the thymus, but it also has an important function uh, con controlling the generation of regulatory T cells. Right, and so, I mean, you talked about um, uh, regulatory T cells p patrolling in the periphery. What are they doing <coughs> when that? What are they patrolling? What do they do that when they find something? What, what are they? What are they doing? <laughs> yeah, you mean what's their mechanism of action? Yeah, uh, they they seem uh, uh, to have different mechanism of, of action. They're very several different mechanisms that have been described. Uh, for example, um, they have high IL-2 receptors, and so they're very good at sucking up IL-2 in the vicinity. And so if it's in limiting uh, uh, concentrations of IL-2, the Tregs may uh, basically um, saturate. So that is a damp damping down right. the response by right. quenching the yeah, IL-2, I guess. Basically. Right. Um, and then there are, are some thoughts that they might actually kill uh, dendritic cells that inhibit uh, antigen presentation uh, in oh that I way. See. Um, and then there are cytokine-based mechanisms where uh, things like I they make IL-10 or TGF-beta or um, IL-35, and these can also affect responses. So the question is, uh, all these different mechanisms, is that um, that uh, all the every Treg has the possibility to do all of these things, uh -huh. or is, are there different? Uh, um, is there heterogeneity, and there are different Tregs that are specialized in doing one or the other thing, and they do that in different environments? So I think the field is leaning towards the last. Oh, I see. The right. Tregs are actually a very heterogeneous population. Uh -huh. and there turn out there are Treg populations uh, in the lymph node and spleen, and that's what 90% of the studies on Tregs are about, but as you uh, heard, uh, there's also there are also immune responses in the skin, and there's a special population of Tregs in the skin. And in the gut as I well. In the gut, in the adipose tissue that actually controls uh, metabolic indices. Um, there's a special population that comes into the muscle when you injure the muscle, and each population is uh, quite different from, uh, they have some things in common, but they're also distinct from each other. Mm -hmm. um. So uh, we've heard a fair bit at this meeting about the microbiome. So it, are, they, are they involved in ensuring that we don't uh, produce an immune response to uh, you know, uh, sort of friendly bacteria, so to speak? Uh, yes, definitely. And also um, the microbiome, some particular bugs are important for generating a healthy uh, Treg response in the uh -huh. gut. Right. Oh, I see. So that's <coughs> that's interesting. So it sort of br brings a um, whole new meaning to the word sort of uh, self non self description. Exa if yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a nice. So what is self and what is non self? Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's, that's a sort of nice existential question to end on. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for talking Thanks. to us, Diane. <laughs>